you just sang to the old rugged cross I will ever be true it's shame and reproach gladly bear mm -hmm. folks you don't come here to this building to worship the building we don't even come to worship this group of our body of believers. You don't come to hear me, I hope. I hope you come to worship God and to be true to him. We need to be faithful to the ministry of, that God's called us to for sure. And we need to be faithful to be here in, in our places. But we do so to honor God. And it's his salvation that we think about and that makes it possible to be here. And I hope you'll never forget that. Well, you are not going to Revelation this morning. Go to First Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians, First Thessalonians, please. First Thessalonians. Go to the book. We're going to look at several verses. If you want to put your finger in chapter 5, verse 23, that's going to be the primary verse that I'm going to preach from this morning. I have uh, been referencing the book of 1 Thessalonians several times in the last Sunday, uh, several Sunday messages as we've talked about the second coming of the Lord, as we've talked about the day of the Lord, as I did last Sunday, uh, from uh, on the sixth seal and Revelation chapter six. Because 1 Thessalonians gives us more doctrine about the second coming than any other book of the, of the Bible, pretty much. Uh, it was written, of course, by Paul, the apostle. It was written, um, it's actually one of the earliest epistles that were written, that was written. Um, it was written somewhere ar around 50 or 51, 52 AD. Um, the only books there weren't too many books of the New Testament that were written before the Thessalonian epistles. And, uh, of course, Paul founded the church at Thessalonica as he moved into um, Macedonia. It was the first place he went to after he heard the Macedonian call. And um, he founded the church. He taught them doctrine, and he left. And then he got a report that of the faithfulness of this church, although there was a little problem because they so believed in the second coming that they were starting to just stop what they were doing, and they were getting concerned about the believers that were passing away, and Jesus hadn't come back. And hence... Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. As I was studying for the Revelation messages, I was brought to this book more than once, and it's why we're coming back to it this morning. In this book, Paul mentions the second coming in every chapter. In all five chapters, it's mentioned at least once. I didn't really know that. I hadn't noticed that before. I was studying it. That's why I say Paul talks about it more in this book than any of the other books. Um, you'll find it in chapter 1, verse 10. You'll find it in chapter 2, verse 19. Chapter 3, verse 13. Of course, chapter 4, the last half of, or last part of chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, the great passage on the rapture. And then last week, we referenced chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And then he mentions it again at the, toward the end of the chapter in verse 23, which that is our text this morning. I 
I have entitled my message this morning, My Prayer for Gethsemane Baptist Church. Because as Paul mentions in this verse, in verse 23 of chapter 5, what he says about the church in Thessalonica, Thessalonica is exactly how I feel about you. Let's read together. In fact, let's read out loud together verse 23 of chapter 5. Can we do that? We don't usually do that very often. But let's all read it together. Verse 23 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It begins with, and the very God. Everybody there? Let's read it together out loud, please. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we look into your word today, I pray that you'll give me the power of your spirit to proclaim the truths of this passage. May it be clear. May it challenge us. May it give us determination, Lord. To stay faithful to that which you've called us to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Paul's lesson to the Thessalonians was obvious. He was talking about the second coming. And that's what I've just been talking about. He talks about it more than any other issue that he talks about it is the primary reason for him writing the book it's really obvious if you read through it as he talks about the second coming of the Lord he is encouraging these Thessalonic, uh, Thessalonian Christians they were undergoing persecution already some had died for their faith already in this church and Paul was encouraging them that folks, this Christian life, hard as it may be, is worth it. And that one day, Jesus is coming again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we need to live for him. We need to worship him. We need to serve him. And so his lessons to the Thessalonians was obvious about the second coming. His love for the Thessalonians was overflowing. Turn back to chapter 2. This passage is just... You see Paul's love for the Thessalonians is almost unparalleled. Uh, I, he loved all the churches he founded. Some were better than others. Some had a whole lot more problems than others. But this church was somehow special to Paul. And look at chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. He says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Folks, let me, let me explain what Paul is saying. He's saying, first of all, that he loved and cared for them like a nursing mother. And it says nurse there, but it's talking about a mother who is nursing their little one. There is no closer bond than the bond between a child and its nursing son or daughter. I told you Julie used to work at, at the hospital on campus and they, were, they did a lot of deliveries there. And the very first thing you try to do when you get, when that baby is delivered, after you wipe it off and get it dried and warm, is you get that baby to breast. For several reasons. 
You get it to bond with its mother and the mother to bond with it. The action of, of that causes the mother anatomical things to happen in the mother to heal up from the delivery. It's all part of the way God made the body and that bond between a nursing child and its mother is precious. Everyone here, that every lady here that has been there knows what I'm talking about. Man, we don't even have a clue. <laughs> we don't even have a clue. I've always said if, if God made it man to have babies, uh, that would be instant population control. Because man would have one and say, forget that. But not women. And God has given them a special bond. And that was the bond that Paul said he had with this Thessalonian church. He loved and cared for them as a nursing mother or child. It says he was affectionately desirous for them in verse 8. That phrase, affectionately desirous, is used nowhere else in Scripture. It means that he felt a closeness with them. It says, in fact, that he was willing to give his own life. His, he says he was giving, willing to give his soul for them. He says that they were dear unto them. That means beloved. Paul had a love for this church that was more than, I mean, I'm sure he loved all the churches he founded and, and he had affection for a lot of them, but he doesn't verbalize it the way he does to this church. And it, it was just a special bond that Paul had with this church. Folks, I want you to know that I know how Paul felt. As the pastor of this ministry of this church, I feel like I have a special bond with you, each and every one of you. I love you more than I could begin to express that I love you and care about you and pray for you and pray for the burdens that you have. I know how Paul felt. In a small way. I am, no, I am no way trying to say I'm Paul at, at all. But I know what he. I know that emotion that he had. Toward this church that he was mentoring. And, and pointing to Christ. It was a special bond. Then in verse 23 of chapter 5. Where we started. Paul's lessons to the Thessalonians was obvious. How many times he talked about the second coming. His love for the Thessalonians was overflowing in that chapter of the verses we just read. His longing for the Thessalonians was outstanding in verse 23. He had a prayer for peaceful sanctification. He says, and the very God of peace. And then that next word, sanctify you wholly. He had a prayer for peaceful sanctification. God's peace would be with them. He had a prayer for perfect sanctification. That word holy, in the, the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly, actually has a double meaning. It not only means that they, each and, in, each and every one of them, is completely sanctified, but it's talking even more so about the whole group at Thessalonica. That the very God of peace would sanctify the whole group. It has the idea of, of not just an individual completeness, but a group completeness. I said my, my title for this is My Prayer for Gethsemane, and that is, my, this is my prayer for you. That the God of peace would sanctify, bring each one of you 
individually and as a group into holiness. That's what sanctification means. To have your body set apart, holy, H-O-L-Y, holy to God. And so he had a prayer for perfect sanctification. Then he had a prayer for preserved sanctification. Notice it says, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. A prayer for preserved sanctification. And then he had a prayer for profound sanctification. And this is more individual. It was the whole body. He uses the phrase your whole spirit and soul and body. That is the only time in the Bible that those three aspects of the human being are put together in one verse. Your whole spirit and soul and body. You all know just like God is three persons in one. In a similar fashion, we are three parts. We have the spirit. That is our spiritual being. That part of us that accepts or rejects Christ. That's our spirit. And then the word soul, the Greek word soul there, is talking about the life. The Bible says that God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Our soul is that which lives and which distinguishes us from other animals who also live, but we have a soul that lives, is our life. Our, it's the Greek word psyche. Okay, it's, it's the way we think, the way we live. Other times in the New Testament, that word soul is actually translated life. So that's what it, ha it has to do with. And then, of course, body is that physical part of us. Now, other parts in, in, in the Bible talk about three parts. They talk about the... It, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and then repeated by our Lord in all of the synoptic gospels, as well as some of the other epistles. Paul repeats that. Sometimes it includes the word might uh, in that, in that uh, formula. And here again, folks, I know how Paul feels here. Paul had a longing for the Thessalonians that they might be sanctified. That every part of them, their spirit, their soul, their life, and their body be totally set apart. Folks, that is my desire for each and every one of you in this room today. That you would live a life that would honor God because it is set apart for God in every aspect of it. That's my desire for you. Just as it was Paul's desire for the Thessalonians. To that end, I desire that each and every one of you be in God's will. That you be following God's will. You cannot be set apart and sanctified if you're not following God's will. In fact, we all must follow God's will for our lives. You may recall back on February 14th, after Pamela asked about how Julie and I got together, I, met, I talked about that on that Sunday night, and I gave a message on the will of God. 
as part of that. In that message, I made the comment, sometimes following God's will takes us down paths we'd rather not go. We still must follow God's will. We still must do what God has called each of us to do. That is true for you, and that's true for me. If we get outside of God's will, we, we, we might as well not be living. If we are not following God's will, if we're saved and we refuse to follow God's will, I believe eventually he's going to take us to heaven. Because he leaves us here to do his will. And that is to tell others, to, to minister to others, to do the job that he's called us to do. And each of us must do that. As Paul loved the Thessalonians and desired that they be fully and completely sanctified. And therefore, they also follow God's will. That is my heart and my prayer and my desire for each and every one of you this morning. Over the last year, actually a little more than a year, God has been doing a work in my heart. Actually, he's been doing it for a lot longer than that. But what I'm getting ready to tell you is something that goes back more than a year. As I have sought out and tried to follow God's will for my life. Of course, you know, about a year ago, Julie's mom passed away. And that has been a whole year's process for us to work through her estate and do all the things that have to be involved. It's involved several trips up to Indiana for her funeral and to take care of other estate matters. I didn't know what God was doing. I didn't know how, what, why he was bringing these things, events into our lives. But I was praying. When we were up in Indiana in December on one of those trips and to deal with some things with Hannah, we visited Julie's home church. It's interesting, the pastor of that home church, the interim pastor right now, is a man that was my pastor when I was young. We're talking back in the 70s, okay? I know you guys don't even understand what, and I, you don't know anything about the 70s, but some of you do. So it was interesting when I walked in and saw him there, um, I knew, he. I had heard before we got there that he was there. I was actually looking forward to seeing him. We walked in. And the first thing he said to me as I walked in that door of that church is, Brian, you need to come be pastor of this church. My reaction, not interested. I have a church here. In Greenville, a church I love, a church I have no interest in leaving. And besides, the thought of moving, ugh. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't get away from that. For two plus months, I fought with the Lord. 
I said, no, Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go up there. I don't want to move. I don't want to leave my church here. But as time progressed, it became clearer and clearer and clearer to Julie and I that this was God's will. I don't want to go. I don't. But folks, I've got to follow God's will. I've got to do what God has called me to do. And I have, Julie has, spent a great deal of time praying about this. And every step of the way, God has made it abundantly clear to us that this is what we're supposed to do. I, in the days ahead, I will probably share with you more about how God has led. As I said, this has been quite a process. The previous pastor at Julie's Home Church has been gone for over a year. They've had a number of people candidate. And every time somebody goes to candidate, something strange happens. Until me. <laughs> I guess. Uh, I mean, they were telling me about some of the things that the pastor would candidate, and he'd, 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 they'd get ready to vote, and then he'd call and say, I can't come for this reason or that reason or another reason. So they've been without a shepherd for a year. That's not good. As I told you, the present interim pastor there uh, was my pastor when I was growing up at my home church in Newton, Kansas. I find that abundantly interesting and not coincidental. <laughs> God was in that. Amen. And I, I, it's amazing. We have a long history with this church. And I'll tell you, I've been married to Julie now for 30, over 30 years. And she told me something that kind of was in the end, the one thing that God finally said, see, I'm trying to tell you, would you listen? But she told me back in February, or maybe late January, I don't remember when it was exactly, but that when she was growing up, it was her dream to be the pastor's wife of that church. I'm like, you've never told me that before. <laughs> and again, it was one of those things that the Lord used to show me that he's been orchestrating these events for a very long time. And I can't fight God's will. Please know the following. Please know, with God as my witness, we did not seek this. This was dropped in our lap. God sought this and brought it to us. It's not something I would have, I wasn't, I, I was not thinking about leaving, had no reason to leave. God brought it to us. I want you to understand as well, I'm not leaving. 
because of any problem or situation in this church. Like I said, I love you all. I love every single one of you. And I never anticipated leaving. We still love this church. I want to promise you that I will still pastor this church until the day that I get in my vehicle and pull out of, of Greenville. Today is not my last day. And I hope you won't in your mind let today be my last day. Okay? I have communicated, the deacons knew this was coming and they still are here this morning. I met with them back in February to let them know what was happening and that this was a possibility. I didn't want to say anything more public than that until I knew for sure. But just so that you understand the timeline, you all know I went up to Indiana the end of February. It was to move Hannah and, and Heather back up there. But why we were up there, um, I did officially candidate at the church, at Julie's Holmes Church, Coatesville Missionary Baptist Church is the name of the church. And I did officially candidate for the position of pastor there. Last Sunday, they voted. So this is the first Sunday after I've known for sure that I did know for sure that I wanted to let you all know. One of the things we pray is if, if God was in this, that he would show us in a way that could not be denied. There's been more than one thing that has happened since we began considering this that has shown us that. But the final one was that the vote up there was absolutely unanimous. They have asked me to come. I didn't even get that good of a vote here. <laughs> <laughs> Not anything against you, okay? I, I don't know who, who didn't vote for me when I first came to be pastor here. And I don't care. I assume that those, those people are probably not here anymore. <laughs> but um, that was what the, the Lord said. See, I want you here. You cannot argue with this. And so my plan, I'm, I'm basically essentially giving a two month notice. Um, I, will, I want to stay students for you. <laughs> I want to, I, a number of you are graduating this year. I want to be here for that. Mm -hmm. It's going to take us a while anyway to get <laughs> packed up in a life. I've been in Greenville since 1982. So I got a lot of things here <laughs> and uh, we got to get all of that packed up. Yeah. So my last Sunday, will either be May 9th or the 16th. May 9th is the Sunday right after the students leave. May 16th would be the next week. One, one of those Sundays will be my last Sunday and as the day gets closer, I'll be more definite on that. Again, I want you to know I still love every single one of you. I care about you. Um, I will work with the deacons as closely as they want me to. <laughs> if they want me to keep my nose out, I will. <laughs> if they want me to be involved, I will. I, I pray that God brings someone here quickly that will love you the way I love you and that will shepherd you the way I have tried to shepherd you. But I will work with them as closely as they want me to, to help find a replacement. I know that, I'm not sure what John's thinking. I know that Brother Dave's got a couple of ideas in mind. So um, we'll, we'll need, to say. what's that? I'm going to twist your arm to say. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to twist God's arm, brother. <laughs> okay, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. 
Um, anyway, we're going to need to form a pulpit committee. Um, obviously, the deacons will be part of that. If any of you other men want to be involved in that process, you let one of the deacons or myself know, and we'll be glad to bring you into that process. Um, Pastor Gatlin does know. And by the way, one other piece of the puzzle is that he's planning on coming back. He, his, his position as interim pastor of Calvary is ending, and he'll be back here sometime in April. I don't want to say exactly when. because He's told me when, but that's subject to change, so I don't know exactly when he'll be back, but he will be back before I leave. Um, I'm not suggesting to you, by the way, that he be the next, that he be the pastor again. He doesn't want that. He feels God has called him to a, a ministry of being an interim pastor, and so that's what he wants to do. Um, I don't know if you want him to fill that position here for a while. Uh, you know, you guys can discuss that if you want. But that again is just another piece of the puzzle that the Lord is showing me that He's putting everything in place to make it possible for me to leave. So I want to assure you that. Now I want to I want to beg of you. As one that loves you, cares about you and as one that, that loves this ministry. I have been involved in Gethsemane Baptist Church now for over 10 years. I've been the pastor for about half of that. I love this ministry. I beg of you, please don't go because I'm going. This ministry needs each and every one of you. I hope that you're not here and faithful just to me. I hope that you're here and faithful to God. This is God's ministry. This is not my ministry. And God's going to keep it going. But this ministry needs each and every one of you. And I hope that you will remain faithful to it in this transition, in this process. I don't quite know what else to say. Um, I wanted to allow just a little bit of time. I know it's afternoon, but do you have any questions for me right now? Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. He was already, he's been telling Brother Nichols and I that he was coming back for mm -hmm. at least three months. But they have called a new man there at Calvary, and he is already in place, and Pastor is only finishing up his Sunday school class, and then he'll be coming back. And we have, he's given, like I said, he's given us a date. I'm not going to give you a date because I don't know whether that's really going to be the date or not. But no, I have not asked. And, and I want you to know, like I said, I'll be as involved as you want me to. I want to be involved. I care about this ministry. But I am not going to decide who the next pastor is. That is your choice. With the decision of the deacons. Yes, sir. I just want to say how much you have responded to the people's desires. Anything you have to say or curious about or suggest, Brother God and I will let them know what type of this. Um, we want this. Any other questions? Yes, Sarah. This is why I asked you to be here in the service today. I put Miles over there because I told Miles ahead of time what was going on as well. Um, and I wanted him to cover the junior church. 
so that Sarah could be in here with us um, instead of in junior church like she so faithfully usually is. So anyway, this is why. <laughs> she asked me. <laughs> I won't go into that. <laughs> anyway, any other questions? Can we be dismissed? Is that a question? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I know. Anything else? All right. Well, I want to be open and honest with you. And if you have questions of Julie or I, um, we'll do what we can to answer them in the days ahead. And we'll work together. May God be glorified. Please pray for Julie and I. Um, mm. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to the process. <laughs> but um, by the way, huh? Yeah. By the way, just so that you understand, the church up there is roughly the size of this church. Actually, maybe a little smaller right now, since they've been without a pastor for over a year. They've lost some people. And so um, I didn't take it to get a raise <laughs> or to get a bigger church. I took it because this is what God wants. All right. Well, bless Naomi's heart. She already came up. Would you stand and let's be dismissed. Brother John, would you come up to the podium, please? And would you please close our service in prayer? After the service, Julie and I will be up here if you want to come up and talk. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for just another day in your house. Father God, about all we can say is thank you. Because you're a sovereign God. You're in control of everything for your will for your glory, and for all your people's good. Amen.